I'm Dave Yoder. I'm a photographer and getting into filmmaking. And Ben Q invited me to talk about what it was like for me to shoot for National Geographic. They also asked if I'd like to try out one of their new monitors, the SW321C right here. And I'll give my thoughts about that at the end. At the end, there's also gonna be a question and answer session. So if you think of anything, jot it down. And I'll try to get to it. My path to geographic really began in college at Indiana University, where I was studying journalism and African studies. And it was there that I started working on my first photo essay on bounty hunters. I worked on that on and off for about four years uh, while I was uh, doing internships and uh, ended up going out and working at the Orange County Register in California for 10 years. Uh, the bounty hunter story taught me that you can't get second chances at getting the moment, the right moment. And working at the Orange County Register was, uh, was a luxury and, and a privilege. It was uh, very high standards, and it was one of the only two or three newspapers shooting transparency film at the time, which was what National Geographic was working with exclusively as well. So all these things kind of like uh, set me up for uh, being technically prepared. But photography is only a small part of a National Geographic assignment, maybe even as little as 10%. The rest is uh, innumerable other factors that, that uh, dictate whether a project's gonna be successful or not. One of the hardest stories for me that I've ever done was on the radio telescope array called ALMA in the Atacama Desert in Chile at 17,000 feet, right at the point where I get altitude sickness. This is ALMA, one of the world's largest radio telescope arrays searching for the origins of the universe. But I wanted to give the project a sense of place. I didn't want it to just be about science. So I spent some time in the area, capturing the, the tourists who come for stargazing and go to the local bars and, uh, and uh, spent some time at a rodeo, just uh, photographing the, the environment. I didn't want it to just be a story about science. One of the best things about stories like these is getting to experience cultures you wouldn't have uh, had an excuse to be immersed in. But once I had to get down to the project at hand, I would timed the uh, visit so that I would catch uh, the last few of the radio telescopes being assembled. They're shipped in from all over the world and, and quite literally glued together. The workers are mostly locals and they're very highly trained. Here they're mixing epoxy to literally glue the two halves of a new dish together that had just arrived from Europe. I got some of that glue on my blue jeans while I was shooting and it never came out. Of course, to get access like this, uh, you have to be trusted. They allowed me to walk around on these dishes, just like the workers, and I made sure to be very, very careful and demonstrate that I was being very careful about everything I did. Safety was far and away the number one priority at the site, and I had to be very careful to conform to all of the rules. This radio dish is being transported up the mountain to the array on the top of the plateau. Uh, these things move terribly s slowly. It takes uh, pretty much most of a day for one of them to get up from the staging area to make it to the top of the plateau where, where it's positioned. The radio telescopes are beautiful at any time of day. They're fantastic objects to see. But it was pretty clear to me right away that the best time to photograph them was at night. So I went to great lengths to uh, find ways to get elevation, borrowing equipment, and staying up there all night in a basically in a pickup truck so I didn't freeze to death. At 17,000 feet, though, it was really exhausting for me, and uh, it was impossible to sleep up there. It felt like uh, somebody was sitting on my chest. These giant dishes are sitting on eerily silent magnetic motors, and throughout the night, they swing from position to position during observations. I got the idea to uh, fix a camera to one of these and do long exposures, so I recruited Bill Johnson, one of the technicians, to help me with this idea. It involved climbing into the cabin of the, of the antenna and staying in there all night. 
uh, that was the door that has now become the ceiling as the as the antenna swung vertically. It was kind of like being in the, in the fun. It was kind of like being in a fun house. We stayed in the cabin of the antenna all night, uh, trying all sorts of different exposures while the the antenna gyrated and and moved around. Even though I'd gotten the operation approved by the safety department, somebody in upper management had not been told, and somebody was not very pleased the next day when they found out about it. It helped that I explained we had two assistants in radio contact the whole time we were out there all night. But I was told, well, you got yourself an exclusive because uh, you did the right thing by getting it approved by safety, but we're never going to let anybody do this again. I think it's important to let your own curiosity drive the direction of your photography. In 2007, I saw a little newspaper article about an art forensics detective who was uh, picking up the mantle in the search for a lost Leonardo da Vinci painting that might still be behind a fresco in the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence. I thought, well, that sounds like a pretty cool idea. This is an etching of the part of the Battle of Anghiari that Leonardo allegedly finished on the wall. Some experts think that the part of the painting that Leonardo did finish is behind the Vasari fresco in this area of the wall. The Palazzo Vecchio is the old city hall of Florence, hosting that tower in the background. Inside it, the largest room is the Hall of 500, where the Grand Council used to meet. Maurizio Saracini, on top of the scaffold, is a high-tech art sleuth who has been looking for a way to detect the painting without damaging the Giorgio Vasari frescoes on top of where it once was. We know what the painting looked like through several copies that are believed to be contemporary. This one, the Rue July copy, was presumed lost. I found it by going to the phone books and calling all of the Rue July family names that I could find in Italy. Finally, I found a lawyer named Cosimo Rue July in Milan who said, yes, I've got it in my closet. This copy of one of the warrior's heads from the main battle scene is believed to have been taken from the original cartoon. It's in the Ashmolean in Oxford. Professor Frederick Peel in Bavaria has been obsessed with the Battle of Anghiari for decades. Nobody knows what happened to the Battle of Anghiari, but there are clues in the palace records that it was on the wall for quite some time. These palace records document the purchase of wood to protect the painting from Spanish soldiers garrisoned in the hall. It's believed the painting was on the wall for about 50 years after Leonardo left for Milan. Scholars have searched for decades for clues about the fate of the painting. Leonardo painted in the hall with five assistants for about a year before he was called to Milan by the French ruler. He left in 1506. In 1549, Anton Francesco Doni wrote to a friend of Michelangelo's, who was visiting, saying, Climb the steps of the Palazzo Vecchio, and you'll see a clash of horses by Leonardo, which you will regard as a miraculous thing. One of the notable high-tech attempts to find the lost Leonardo is by Maurizio Saracini, who, in trying to find a non-destructive way to find the painting behind the Vasari fresco, conducted tests at the Nuclear Research Center Enea outside Rome. However, the neutron backscatterer they were going to use wouldn't create an image of the painting. Being a photographer, I needed a picture, even if it was of something that was behind a brick wall. I don't know anything about physics, but a fair amount of Googling led me to Bob Smither at Argonne National Laboratory. He's the only person in the world who builds a copper crystal mosaic gamma ray diffraction lens. I called him, told him about the project, and he said, give me a week. And when I called him back, he had crunched some numbers and figured he could build a camera that could detect and even image a painting behind a brick and plaster wall. And he was willing to donate his time, but he wanted to do the testing in Italy. I just needed to find a neutron source. So I called my friends at Enea, and they donated two weeks with this, a 10 to the 13th neutrons per second neutron generator. I'm not even really sure how much that is, but it sounds like a lot. We ordered pigments that are very much like what we know Leonardo ordered for the wall, thanks to Palace Records. So we got to work, happily bombarding pigments with neutrons, and then measuring the energies and half-lives of the gamma rays that came out of those pigments, which would tell us what kind of metal is in the pigment, 
which would tell us what kind of color it is. The test showed that in theory we could scan the wall and possibly even create an image of the painting while it was still behind the brick wall. Everything was looking great. We got permission from the fire department in Florence and Enea to use the gamma camera to look for the painting. But there was one important calculation we could not have accounted for in this birthplace of Machiavelli, politics. City officials rejected bringing a neutron generator into Florence, and instead they ordered that holes be drilled through the wall in areas that contained no original Vasari fresco pigment. That wasn't a solution that anybody wanted, but it was a take-it-or-leave-it scenario. There was an upside, though. The scaffolding would allow art conservationists an opportunity to restore the Vasari fresco, which had been deteriorating over the centuries. You might recognize the Hall of 500 from the Tom Hanks movie Inferno. And this inscription, Cerca Trova, it really is up there on the wall, but it's not really believed to signify anything important. While shooting in the hall, I tried to take advantage of the grandiose environment and the art all around me. I tried to mimic the Renaissance feel in some of my pictures. I'm a firm believer in not staging photographs, not only for ethical reasons, but I think it just makes you lazy and you stop looking for new images. You're not open, you're closed if you've already decided what you want to shoot. So I think of pictures more like gifts than things to make or take. Over the next few weeks, six holes opened up into the wall were explored using videoscopy. They were all drilled into the southeast portion of the hall because that's where some historians believe the painting probably was painted, but nobody knows for sure. The results were disappointing. Nothing was found that indicated the painting was in that location, but that certainly doesn't rule out the possibility that the painting is somewhere else in the hall. For now, I consider this story to be dormant, sleeping, waiting. Another story that put me in the hospital in NIH with leishmaniasis and also almost got me killed in a helicopter incident was a search for a lost city in the Mosquitia jungle in Honduras. This area of the Mosquitia jungle had not been explored, nor is it believed to have had indigenous residents in over 500 years. It's an incredibly beautiful part of the world. I'd never been to this area before, and I was uh, just blown away by the beauty of the jungle. I was already familiar with LiDAR from working in the Hall of 500. It was used to map the palace. This new application of LiDAR, though, where it was able to penetrate the forest canopy, revealed the ruins of an ancient civilization that had long since abandoned the area. I immediately thought of National Geographic. And when the president of Honduras found out that National Geographic was involved, he committed army helicopters to the project which was really the only way to transport so many people and so much equipment in and out of the jungle. Hondurans recognized it as an opportunity to celebrate and explore their cultural heritage, as well as visit a part of the jungle that hasn't been seen by human eyes in a very long time. This project was actually two one-month-long trips. On the first trip, I shot stills, and on the second trip, I shot stills, video, and photogrammetry with the help of two assistants. We spent a lot of time shuttling in and out of the jungle. During the first trip, it rained almost continuously, 
had terrible problems keeping laptops and cameras going. I hadn't brought nearly enough desiccants to keep the cameras dry, and those, those petered out pretty quickly. We did a fair amount of exploring of other sites, picked up on the lighter as well, bushwhacking through fairly dense foliage and jungle. I'd grown up on Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, and there was rainforest there, but uh, this was my first jungle experience. It was uh, eye-opening. We have to be very careful about everything we're recording because we're not coming back. We're we can't put it away, put it back as it was. In the laboratory, looking back to this, all this data, that's how we can come up with the answers. So right now we might have been thinking about, oh, this means this, but the answers will happen later when we analyze this data. So everything can change. It's kind of hard to see, but they're standing on a human-made structure. The Mosquitia culture are so little known that they don't, they don't even really have a name. But we saw evidence of their previous inhabitants all around us. This whole story is chronicled in a Douglas Preston book that was a number one New York Times bestseller called The Lost City of the Monkey God. While we were there, more than half of the party, myself included, contracted leishmaniasis. It's a flesh-eating protozoa that eats away at the skin. We were all treated at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda. On the first trip, we stumbled across a cache of matates and other ceremonial ornaments. Matates look like stools that were used to grind grain. This particular matate, which appears to have a jaguar head on it, gave the nickname to the site the City of the Jaguar. While I don't orchestrate what I'm shooting, sometimes I will bring in a light to help things out. I knew that the muddy light of the under canopy jungle was going to be problematic. It comes across as blue and just kind of drab. So I had either an assistant or whoever was free uh, basically hold a light up for me on a pole. And uh, I still let people just go about doing their business and try to stay out of the way. But I needed some kind of punch to penetrate the darkness and bring people out of all the earth tones. Even the soldiers got involved in the excavation. They were trained and recruited to help sift through all the, the earth that was uh, scraped up by the archaeologists. As the days dragged on, the site just kept getting bigger and bigger. They kept finding matate after matate, and they pretty soon realized it was a very significant find. Chris Fisher, the lead archaeologist, figured it was probably the biggest find of ceremonial matates ever, at the very least the biggest one since 1902 in Costa Rica. I had to sometimes leave the jungle to send pictures to National Geographic, and on one of the trips out, I couldn't see it because I was strapped in facing the other way, but the door of the helicopter ripped off. given the green light to sort of close the door um, by putting my hand on it just ever so slightly and just pushing it forward. With the amount of wind that was swirling around the back of the aircraft, it actually got underneath the, uh, the door itself and just ripped it clean off its hinges. And as you can see, it's caused a fair bit of damage to the aircraft, but more importantly, somehow, by the grace of God, it never hit the top rotor and the tail rotor on its way into the, uh, into the jungle. So, yeah. All in all, a very close call. We lost, a, we lost a door in the middle of the flight, and the whole flight from the jungle here was without a door. And I felt like we were going to die because I didn't, I didn't know if it went directly to the rotor or what. Uh, so for a second, I was like, oh, OK, so we're going to die in the jungle. I was really scared. And then the whole flight, every movement, I was like, what if something falls and that makes the helicopter die, uh, fall? I was really scared. As the artifacts were excavated, they were carefully carried down the mountain and flown to the staging area, which was an air base, where they were cataloged and cleaned and basically prepared for a new life on exhibition. 
I'd been staying on the excavation site just in case something exciting happened. But I found out that I'd only have a very short period of time to photograph the cleaned objects before the military took them over. Everybody's schedules kept changing, and it turned out that I only had about an hour and a half to photograph as many of these artifacts as I could, and there were a lot of them. It was a big find. I knew I had a pretty big problem on my hand because to light that many wildly different artifacts would take a lot of time for every single one. So I decided to light paint them, like I had the artifacts while they were still in the ground on the previous trip. That's because there just wasn't enough time to rearrange lights for every single artifact. Now, apart from the previous trip, I had only light painted something maybe once before, so I had to learn on the job. A lot of photography is on the spot problem solving, figuring out what am I gonna do in this situation and figuring it out pretty quickly. So I got the pictures out and they published in the online edition. The magazine had already run a story from the previous year's trip, so another magazine story was uh, unlikely. So everything worked out pretty well. I had really an experience of a lifetime, grew to love the jungle, at least that jungle. And despite the leishmaniasis, I actually kind of missed the place. Like we were discovering these physical question marks about a culture that nobody really understands very much about, other than that they were neighbors to the Maya. It was really a chance hallway encounter with the editor of the magazine that launched me into a totally unexpected project on Pope Francis and the Vatican. I was living in Rome at the time and I, I had happened to run into Chris Johns during the annual photographer seminar and just casually mentioned, you know, there's a heck of a lot of interest about Pope Francis and nobody had really uh, been able to do a, a, a big story on him. The National Geographic hadn't done a story on the Vatican in 30 years. Uh, that story had been done by the great James Stanfield and I remember when it came out. I was a student at Indiana University. So that was a major dog catching the car moment. I had no idea how to go about getting the kind of access that would be required for a National Geographic story. To make things worse, the new editor-in-chief, Susan Goldberg, made it pretty clear that she wanted it for the cover. Luckily, I already knew the American ambassador to Italy, John Phillips, who'd been a friend for several years, and I asked him whether he could help me get a meeting with the Vatican, considering that National Geographic is an iconic American name. He said he'd be willing to help, but there's really the territory of the American ambassador to the Vatican, who was Ken Hackett at the time. So he contacted, they contacted the Holy See and proposed a dinner, and the Holy See countered with a lunch, which of course we accepted happily. And Ambassador Hackett said, well, since we've already got two ambassadors, why don't we get the third American ambassador in Rome, who was David Lane, the ambassador to the UN food agencies. So... We had three American ambassadors. Susan Goldberg also decided to come out for the meeting. We had the lunch at Ambassador Hackett's residence, and it went great. At the end of it, the representatives from the Holy See said they'd help us however they can. However, what I didn't know was that I'd still have to figure out how to make it work. Vatican City is run almost like a number of independent little territories. Realistically, there wasn't one particular authority who could get me all the access that I needed, and I kept finding myself lumped in with the rest of the media, which obviously wasn't really going to work for National Geographic, considering the magazine expects something special out of every project they do. And apart from the great intimidation of it already having been chosen as a cover story, I was also following James Stanfield 30 years later on one of his most famous stories that he'd done. That was scary, that was intimidating. But ironically, it ended up being James Stanfield who saved me, indirectly. On one of the days that I was stuck with the rest of the media shooting with a long lens about 100 yards away from Pope Francis, I decided to try to get a hold of the Pope's personal photographer who was always at his side, Francesco Sforza. So I arranged a meeting with him. After a little while, he agreed, and I explained to him that I was working for National Geographic, of course, and that, yes, I was seeking special treatment, 
but that I would never put my own work above his and his co-workers, and I would always respect the rules of the uh, of the Holy See, and that I wouldn't embarrass anybody or make a spectacle or, or cause any kind of problems. And I'd stay out of his way. You know, that I would never put my own photography above his or his co-workers. He agreed to take me on one excursion with Pope Francis to try out the arrangement. I was really careful to stay out of his way. Afterward, he said he talked to his boss and they decided it was okay that I could basically accompany him and his co-workers and photograph Pope Francis alongside them. It was a ridiculously privileged situation to be in. He told me that no other photographer had ever been given this kind of access. Then he told me why he even considered my request in the first place. 30 years ago, he was a young photographer starting out at the Vatican City, right when James Stanfield started his story. And he was assigned to escort James Stanfield around Vatican City during his assignment. And he was a big fan of National Geographic. So that really went in my favor and it made all the difference in the world. I also went to introduce myself to the head of security. And within a week, I would show up at the gates and all of the Swiss guard and the gendarme would know who I was. About a week later, I was photographing a general audience in St. Peter's Square, and I thought I'd try out my new access. So I walked a straight beeline from the line of pilgrims, past the international press, up the steps, and right to the side of Pope Francis while he was greeting people at the general audience. And nobody batted an eye. At that point, I realized that I had extraordinary access, and I wasn't going to betray anybody's trust. I spent almost six months photographing Pope Francis, not every day, of course, maybe two or three times a week, sometimes once a week. And as people got to know me more and more, it became easier to get around. There was never any kind of suggestion of censorship. Nobody ever told me what I could and could not photograph. They just trusted me to use my good judgment. I watched how everybody else behaved around Pope Francis, and I behaved as they behaved. People ask me if he's a real deal, if he really is as he appears to be. I have to say, I don't know. I don't know the man. I haven't had a conversation with him, even though I've met him a few times over the course of the assignment. But over the months that I spent around him, I never saw a single indication that he is harboring any other temperament than what you see in the media. The only time I ever saw him check his watch was when he was around... Vatican people, around staff, around bishops and cardinals. Otherwise, when he was with pilgrims, particularly in the general audiences, which would last a long time, very often in very hot weather, he never skimped on time with devotees. I never saw him cut his time short with pilgrims, even when he was visibly exhausted. And it seemed like he didn't know what to make of selfies, but he played along. Out of all my time there, the most fun I had photographically was during the general audiences on Wednesday mornings, when the pilgrims were whipped into a mania upon seeing him. Their euphoria was palpable. Because of my access, I was able to run alongside the Pope Mobile as he made the rounds through the general audience. It was kind of hair-raising because I literally had to run for fear of being run over by the Pope. It's a good thing I'm not partial to wearing suits because I ruined all of them, drenching them in sweat, running alongside the Popemobile on hot days. I kept going back to shoot it again and again and again. It was almost addictive. It's a little bit ironic, at least to a photographer, that Pope Francis always seems to be in bad light. I had to figure out what to do about it. The general audiences were, you know, in terrible light. The inside of uh, most of the buildings in Vatican City were terrible light. So as with every other assignment, I ended up with a problem-solving situation. I needed to overpower the bad light, but there was no room that close to Pope Francis with his security and all the pilgrims for me to have an assistant. So I got a small but powerful flash head. And I would hold that arm's length in one hand and my camera arm's length in the other hand and use the autofocus button and just kind of uh, eyeball where I was pointing. And of course, every time I'd shoot, it would drain the flash, so I had to be really selective. But it worked. And while I was running alongside the Pope Mobile, really the best pictures were of the pilgrims and how they were reacting to seeing him. 
about the flash, I just went to the head of security and explained what it was. And he said, okay. And maybe the first two or three times I used it, Pope Francis gave me a funny look, but then he got used to it as well and everything was fine. On one occasion, I was in the room with the famous Michelangelo sculpture, La Pietà, and there was a large circle of uh, bishops and cardinals visiting. And Pope Francis was making the rounds on the inside of the circle, greeting them. And I realized too late that I wouldn't be able to exit. I wouldn't be able to get out of this circle without being really conspicuous during some kind of ceremonial greeting. So as Pope Francis was making the rounds, heading my direction, I squeezed between two bishops and pretended I was fiddling with my camera and looking down and just hoping that I wouldn't be noticed. And I realized Pope Francis was standing right in front of me with his hand extended, waiting for me to shake it. He was like that. He shook everybody's hand. It didn't matter who you were. But as the end date approached on my assignment, despite all the time that I'd spent around Pope Francis, somehow I still didn't have a standout cover photo. It was inexplicable. But the standards were really high, considering he's one of the most photographed people on Earth. I was getting frantic as the magazine was starting to look for alternative possibilities. And that would have been extremely embarrassing considering everything that everybody had done for me to get me in the position to photograph the Pope like that. I pinned my hopes on Christmas Day to get a cover photo when he addresses the masses from the facade of St. Peter's Basilica. So through Francesco, I arranged to be on the veranda with him and Pope Francis. But at the last minute, a cardinal overruled and said I couldn't go out, and I was crushed. Francesca could sense my despair, as Pope Francis greeted a long line of visitors who were essentially allowed backstage after the event. I knew from experience that as the long line depleted, that it would just be me and Francesco left standing there with Pope Francis, and that he would turn and greet us and wish us Merry Christmas. That's just how he was. And that's what he did. He greeted me, Merry Christmas. He greeted Francesco, Merry Christmas. And then he turned to one of his aides. I couldn't hear what he said, but Francesco turned to me and he said in an excited whisper, he's going to the Sistine Chapel. I was confused. It wasn't on the schedule. I hadn't heard anything about it and apparently neither had Francesco or he would have told me about it. And he was obviously excited. We crossed the Sala Regia and entered the Sistine Chapel, which was empty because it was Christmas morning. Pope Francis walked in, stopped for about five seconds, looking at Michelangelo's masterworks, and then he turned around and walked back out past us. Francesco turned to me and whispered, there's your cover. Thanks for taking the time to look at my pictures, and I'd like to answer any questions you might have. Real quick, I'd like to mention this BenQ monitor that they sent me to test, SW321C. Um, it is really nice. I've never used a monitor this big before, and I've never used a 4K monitor before, and I didn't feel like I needed to before. Uh, this is really changing my mind. Uh, this monitor in particular, I really love the matte screen finish. Um, it's uh, better than, than just the normal matte screens, and I hate glossy screens. And the tonal gradations, it calibrates really nicely, and it's just uh, the, 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 the quality of the detail really makes a difference. And it's uh, something I'm going to be uh, looking at in the future, personally. So anyway, back to the questions. If you have anything, um, I'll try to field any questions you might have right now. And thanks again. Hi, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I've got a few questions here that I'd like to take a stab at answering. And uh, the first one is from, first one is from Sarah. Um, she's asking, how can you get your foot in the door and start a career in travel slash documentary photography for, now, for a publication like National Geographic? Uh, that's a difficult question to answer because there are really no two, uh, there, there are really no uh, uh, established ways to go about doing that. 
um, everybody has their own route to their own uh, publications, really. And uh, the important thing is to get out and shoot, basically. And and um, it really helps to get a mentor. And, uh, you know, it actually helps quite a bit to read good writing, good literature, um, and, and learn what a good story is. Uh, so, so there's really no particular way to do it other than uh, really be faithful to, to photography and the arts and, and getting yourself out there. And, you know, instead of watching TV, even if you're just like walking around your backyard, even, you know, you can find pictures. Um, it's it's uh, on, on a bigger scale, um, if you really want to go for something like National Geographic or, or Geo or, or uh, you know, a publication or even, you know, get into, uh, you know, some kind of videography, uh, really you kind of, You'd be you'd be best served by uh, saving up some money and and trying to do uh, your own project, which um, is difficult in the sense that it it's hard to pay for some of this your stuff stuff yourself, but it's also liberating because you can take the time that you need on it and you don't have uh, an editor you know uh, clamoring for for your material. And uh, you can basically uh, do a lot more growing along the way than than worrying. So uh, so um, I it, it there there really is no answer to that question um, other than uh, you just go out and try to do it. Meet as many people uh, as many editors as you can. Uh, get to know them, show them your work whenever you can, and you just have to put a lot of effort into it. And I don't mean that as uh, anything negative, because putting a lot of effort into it is a lot of fun. So, uh, so that that's basically I I think what you have to do. I don't have any secret recipe. Um, my, mine certainly was no secret recipe. I just got out there and worked on projects and 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 met people and and you know, tried to be, you know, try not to be a jerk and, and, uh, and got my foot in the door eventually. Um, but that's not to say that uh, it's going to work for everybody. And that's not to say that um, it won't work much better and much faster than it did for me. So let's see, I've got another question from Sue. What exactly makes a picture magazine worthy? Um, Good question. Another really, another really good question. It's it really is very much in the eye of the beholder. Um, I've uh, I have uh, been in edits where uh, I saw one of my pictures uh, selected where I was just like, oh no, that is a terrible picture, you know, and I really hated it and I did not want it to make it through the edit, but. By the end of the process, the editing process, it it would end up being my favorite picture. Um, it, it's I think it's important to uh, accrue to accumulate um, an idea of what a good picture is, be able to recognize it from having seen a lot of work, and also from uh, you know, being immersed in other media as well, you know, writing and, and, and good cinema and things like that, that those other areas are going to help you. And even music are going to help you just as much uh, as <clears throat> looking at other photographs. I, I never look at other pho photographers work uh, for inspiration. Um, I hardly ever look at other photographers work at all. If I need inspiration, um, I, I go to I, I read literature, or I read The New Yorker, or I watch a good film. Um, I don't really find it <clears throat> particularly helpful to look at other photographers' work because, I mean, it's it's almost like I just I kind of start nitpicking or I question why, you know, I get maybe a little jealous sometimes, you know, too many human things kind of come into it. so. So I, I, I really don't, and, and plus, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to copy somebody else's, you know, photography either. So, um, so the, once again, there's no real answer to that question. Um, 
it 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 uh, it's really in the eye of the beholder, and and the most important beholder is you. So so you need to develop that eye yourself, and and be hard on yourself. Um, do not fool yourself into believing a photograph is better than it is. Uh, it it you, you really need to second guess and triple guess and quadruple guess your own work all the time. Not not in a negative way, but just be having a you know question you know talk with yourself going is this picture really as good as I think it is you know and then and then you know you don't have to you don't have to be able to justify it in words but uh, you know photography is all really based on on feeling you know it's not based on on the eye not from some kind of you know some magical eye that can see great photos that doesn't exist it's it's really feeling based so let's see next question um let's see uh from tim do you ever use a camera phone to take and publish pictures uh i have not yet um i think that it's possible i, I don't have a prejudice against it um i just personally kind of don't like the 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 um what 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 you have to do to to take a picture with them and i'm i'm talking about for publication i i take pictures with my my iphone all the time um and a friend of mine michael michael christopher brown uh he shot i think it was the uh civil war in libya with an iphone 4 and that that ran in national geographic uh as i remember um and i think it was an iphone 4 that he shot it with so it, you know, they're even a camera that old. Uh, the 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 photographs are good enough. There's no question about it. He's done some amazing work with an iPhone. So there's absolutely no reason that that you can't work with an iPhone. Um, I just um, haven't uh, had the reason to do it yet, uh, and and I I just prefer more traditional cameras, even even if I really prefer the old days with Kodachrome. Um, but those days are gone. So anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Um, question from Elena. Are there any photos you were really proud of that didn't get the attention publishing that you wish it had? Um, I suppose so, but uh, I really don't. I don't really dwell on that. It just kind of like it, it's part of the editing process where uh, you know you're working with an editor or sometimes several editors, and 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 you're not gonna you know you don't want to even try to win every battle. It, it's more like a conversation and and a give and take. You you, you make your case for some photos and and you got to remember that that uh, the big advantage an editor has over you is that they were not there and they they are not coming in from it from the from the same perspective that that you are, where you already know uh, the story behind that photo or everything that was around that photo, and and so they're seeing it from from in many ways a much more useful perspective. So you need to go into it with humility. Um, you know, you're not the only creative person uh, in the room. Uh, editors are are very creative, and and you need to respect other people's uh, work and their 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 uh, their their uh, opinions as well and the other thing is that i i don't really let myself be proud of my work very often um when i'm shooting a lot i i i'll, I'll be satisfied with maybe one or two pictures a year that i shoot and and by satisfied I, i'll be i mean like um Wow, I really like that picture, and I took it. Um, and maybe one or two a year. Uh, otherwise, um, I'm 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 thinking about you know how could this have been better? Even if it's ostensibly a good photograph already, um, I'm thinking you know, maybe I should have waited longer, or you know I should have done this or that. And and really the key for me is to ask those questions while I'm shooting it, and go and and I say to myself, okay. What am I going to say a week from now about what I'm shooting right now? What should I have done? That's one. That's one thing that I do too. 
So I don't dwell on things like that. You know, um, there, you're, there, there are always going to be pictures that you like that, that, uh, that don't make it in. Um, but the important thing is to not just get so hung up in your own work uh, as, as, you know, don't, don't um, consider yourself a, a visionary um, and, and, you know, take, take, the, take the advice of other people. Is, is what I would say uh, above, you know, uh, uh, having re having regrets over something that you that you like not getting published. Um, okay, uh, a question from Ron. Do you do anything else other than working for National Geographic? Is it enough to sustain a living? Your work is so inspiring. Thanks for your time. Um, well, thanks, Ron. Uh, First of all, um, yeah, yeah, I do plenty of other freelance work, um, and I'm getting into uh, filmmaking as well. Um, I've actually diverged into filmmaking intentionally a fair amount, and and I haven't shot that much for National Geographic uh, in the last two or three years. Um, but that uh, uh, my wife Elise and I are working on uh, two or three projects right now that. That uh, that we're already in talks with uh, National Geographic about on the on the society side. So you never want to throw all your eggs in one basket uh, like that, you know, particularly with National Geographic, um, because you just there there's uh, there's no guarantees that 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 you're going to be able to live off of that. Um, you know, all the budgets have been cut. Uh, particularly in magazines, and that includes National Geographic. So realistically, uh, you, you have to diversify if you're going to do this, uh, you know, making a living. So, um, uh, so I think I answer that. Uh, question from Jay. So, what is your next story you are working on? <laughs> okay. Uh, um, what can I talk about? That's the question. Uh, well, I, I, I'll just say that the Leonardo story uh, is not, in my opinion, over. Um, uh, another thing that we're working on uh, preparing is uh, dealing with uh, a new way of using camera traps. Um, and uh, that, that's, that's basically, um, it, you know, it's not like I'm worried that anybody's going to steal, you know, ideas. That's not it. It's more like, more like concern about overpromising and talking about something that is not off the ground, um, it, which I don't like to do. Uh, so uh, there, there, are, there are things in the works, but um, you know, if if nine out of ten things work out, you're not taking enough chances. So so you know I don't want to I just don't want to talk at length about about things that 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 may not work out because because if you know if, if they all work out then you're not doing something right you're not you know you're not taking enough chances. Um, let's see. Question from Sherry. I'm sorry if I missed this, but what focal length lenses did you use to get the crowd shots? Do you have a favorite lens? Um, by the crowd shots, I presume you mean the uh, the Vatican story, um, the uh, the general audiences. Um, that was probably, I think that was a twenty. I think I was using a, a fixed twenty four uh, most of the time for that. Um, and once again, it was. Uh, I, I think the zoom was a little bit too heavy heavy because I was holding the camera all the way out as far as my right arm could could stretch and my left arm as far as it could stretch the left was holding the flash so i think i'm pretty sure it was a 24 uh my favorite my favorite length is uh is a 28 but uh, is a 28 but there aren't very many you know really good 28 millimeter lenses out there so uh for whatever reason i ended up with a uh, ended up with a 24 uh, on those pictures for the most part. Also because I ended up really too close for a 35 uh, most of the time. Let's see. A uh, question from Sarah. I noticed you are using a Canon camera. What would you recommend for a beginner photographer? 
Oh man, like the cameras are so good these days. Um, almost anything uh, that that is a brand name, honestly. Um, I I simply use Canon. I when I started at university, Indiana University, I think I started. I started using Olympus and then I went to Nikon and then I went to Canon. No, no. And then I went to Leica R. And then uh, when I was working at the Orange County Register, I switched to, I bought a Mamiya 7, which was a medium format film camera, used that for a lot of stuff. But then I ended up switching to Canon particularly when everything went digital, but I'd already moved to Italy by that time. So um, I would say uh, that's, I mean, there's so many really good cameras. It's really hard to answer that question. Um, you know, even little point and shoots can take amazing pictures these days. So, so I think you're, I think that would have to be, you know, cross-referenced against the kind of work that you like to do and, and uh, figure out what works for you and, and um, you know, go into a camera store and play around with the cameras that you like and don't hesitate to decide you don't like a camera after you've already bought it and trade it in and, and get a different one. Um, I've been through lots of different cameras um, and now I'm kind of wedded to can Canon because uh, I'm my cinema uh, camera is, is Canon as, as well and the lenses. I'm just so heavily invested, but I almost started transitioning to Sony recently, uh, but but uh, decided against it just because I didn't like the uh, I didn't like the color science as much. Some people love it. For me, it, it wasn't so great in the mini system. So um, and you know, I I know it's about you know it's about the photographer, not not the cameras, and until it isn't, you know, you gotta you gotta like the tools that that you work with, and and I have no problem with talking gear talk. I I enjoy it. I mean, there's there's nothing wrong with it. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, can I, okay, from uh, Lorenzo. Do you follow any pattern or fixed rule during the pho during the post processing? Some general tip to achieve a nice look. Um, I try to, I mean, make it look uh, how it was shot. Honestly, um, for the most part, uh, I sometimes use a very very light vignette um, in post, uh, but. Normally, I try to do everything in camera. Um, one thing I do do to a small degree is I try to replicate the the feel of film grain. And that's just, I feel like that's fine. That's paying homage to my film background, which I miss dearly. Um, so my, my post-processing is basically, you know, getting the blacks down to, to uh, where they should be and, and uh, mid-tones and basically trying to, uh, trying to make it look, uh, look, look how I shot it. You know, to say, I, I don't necessarily try to make it look normal because um, how, how, how it looked when I was shooting or how it looked without, you know, for example, the flash I was introducing because obviously that I'm obviously I'm trying to change that. Like in the jungle, if I would have not used a flash, it would have just been dark and muddy and blue, and it it just would have been awful. And and that was one of the concerns my editor at Geographic had uh, from the very beginning was jungle light, um, because they they know jungle light very well, and it needed to be overcome. As was uh, the situation with Pope Francis at the Vatican. He was always in terrible light for whatever reason. It was just, uh, and it, it was probably not even, you know, I probably, it was probably about halfway through the assignment before I, I just, you know, decided I'd, I'd been trying to, to tread lightly there so as to not, uh, you know, irritate anybody or, or get me kicked out or anything like that of the, of the privileged situation I had. So I was, um, I was, I, I, it, it wasn't until later in that, that I figured, you know, I, I'm just going to have to figure out, do it this way. And, and so I, I tried that. 
and it, and it worked and I developed it. And that, that's really, I had been shooting with the, with the camera, like, you know, way off, you know, without my eye to the camera, you know, quite a bit. And those were with, I was shooting with 5D, so I couldn't see anything um, when I was shooting any of those pictures. Um, uh, you know, I didn't have any kind of articulating screen. So it was just, uh, I, I don't even know what you call it, uh, Hail Mary or spitballing or, or something like that. So um, I don't, I don't, I don't, heavily I, I don't heavily alter uh what goes into the camera is is the short answer to that um so question from willie in today's covid uh covid pandem pandemic what would you like to cover given a choice as a project that is relevant and can impact societies around uh frankly i mean being totally honest um i'm so many people are doing COVID stories that uh, it, it's a it, it's an incredibly important topic. Um, I'm not dismissing that in any way, but so many people are doing it that I'm I'm I don't feel like I can add anything uh, that would be important. And and so I I mean I've always gone for uh, more unique uh, story ideas. You know I mean. I, I pretty much won't go into uh, a, a big project without, I mean, if it's already been done. I mean, I'm, I'm just not really interested in it. But when I did the Bounty Hunters, that was uh, before, that was my, that was a while ago. That was my first photo essay. That was before all this dog, the Bounty Hunter, Bounty Hunter stuff. Most people didn't even know that Bounty Hunters still existed um, uh, back when I shot it. So uh, it was it was unique at the time. Um, so I, I I mean frankly to be totally honest I I probably wouldn't do uh, a COVID story um, mostly because it's it's like it's just being done by so many people uh, uh, that that it, it's it's there there's no need for me to do it. Um, question from Jay. So what film has inspired you the most? Oh man, um, what film has inspired me the most? Oh geez, there are a lot, there are a lot. Um, I mean, photographically, oh geez, that's really hard to answer. Um, I, I, I mean, I, the, the films that I really like uh, really engage me intellectually and uh I, and it really doesn't have anything to do with with visual storytelling um man i'm just gonna have to duck that question i just don't there are just so many i mean that uh i mean i like classics like casablanca and and uh the passion of joan of arc um and uh and and then and then there are just some really fantastic ones that are more recent, like you know, like the favorite and and that series, The Great. Uh, Alix and I just got done watching that. That's a great series. Um, and uh, there, I mean, just uh, there's so much good, so much good stuff out there. It, it, it's 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 really hard to say. The Third Man, you know, fantastic. Um, you know, even Casablanca. I mean, I, I wouldn't hesitate to watch Casablanca again, you know. Uh, so anyway, I, I'm going to have kind of duck on that one because there are too many. Blade Runner, love Blade Runner. Um, uh, you know, there, there actually there is one that, uh, a Vim Vendors one that, that virtually nobody has seen called Until the End of the World uh, that um, he had shot uh, over five continents with Sam Neill and and uh, and Max von Sydow and and uh, and and I, I got to see a, a first print screening of that in, in Los Angeles when I was out there. That was that was really good. But anyway, uh, I digress. Um, let's see. Question from Rob. Hey Dave, what was the last book you read that really inspired you? Oh man. <clears throat> Rob, I think I know who you are. Uh, 
judging by the uh, spelling of your first name. Um, the last book that you read that really inspired me. Um, well, if, if rereading counts, um, well, I, I, I really love uh, Graham Greene. Uh, I really like his writing. Um, uh, the Heart of the Matter uh, is one of my favorite books. Um, I, uh, I, I recently um, reread uh, a book called Mating by Norman Rush, which um, is, is not what it sounds like. It, it, it's uh, about um, a couple, basically a couple sociologists uh, in, it, it's basically like a, a, a love story be, between two sociologists in the, in the Kalahari Desert, uh, anthropologists, sorry. Uh, and in the Kalahari Desert, it, it's it's really uh, beautifully written, in, intensely uh, intellectual. And I know that dropping that word makes me uh, pseudo intellectual, but uh, it's it's really a fantastic book. It's it's uh, uh, I think it won the National Book Award, and it's it it's not new or anything like that, but um, it's uh, I, I like Conrad. Um, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Uh, I actually um, like Hemingway to a degree, even though it's fashionable to to dump on him recently. Um, I think one of my favorite pieces ever uh, is is a short story by Hemingway called Hills Like White Elephants, uh, which is I think only four pages wrong, four pages long, but it it's you just it's just perfect. It's just perfection, and and it really gets me uh, every single time. Um, and and Joseph Conrad wrote uh, the foreword to one of his books. I'm not going to say the name. It's very unfortunately titled. Uh, but he wrote about the definition definition of art. It's a wrong. It's a rather long uh, essay on the definition of art. And if it wasn't for one sentence, maybe one paragraph, you would not be able to tell that he was not talking about photography. He's actually talking about the art of writing, but but it has more to do with photography. I mean, it has more uh, relevance to photography than any anything else that I've written, uh, that I've read, excuse me. Um, and if I had to go into the world with just one, uh, instruction manual about photography it would be uh conrad's uh, preface on 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 art um so okay let's see a uh, question from tani how much is the photographer part of the editing process well um thanks tani um that well i mean you kind of edit in the field uh and so that is the first edit that happens. Um, and and I'll, I'll be honest, consciously, there there have been plenty of times consciously where I'm like, I better not take that picture because I don't like it. And I know that somebody's going to choose it, you know. So so you, you, you do get the luxury of the first edit. Um, but uh, the, the photographer usually, if, if as long as you don't, as long as it's not like a short freelance job where you send in the in the pictures and hope for the best, in which case you usually do get a fair amount of say in the editing process because you're choosing which ones to send rather than the whole take. Um, usually, it's a it's a collaboration. I I would say it it's generally I'd say 50-50, where. Uh, where you, you you get a fair shake, maybe 60 40 in favor of uh, the, in, in favor of the magazine, but you, you do get a fair shake and you get you get you get respect and and um, you, you know it, it once again you, you do have to approach it with humility though or you, you do want to get hired again. So uh, let's see. Question from L. Um, as a young photojournalist going into the field, I've had trouble sometimes believing in my abilities. 
starting out, did you ever feel that you weren't capable of accomplishing all you've uh, you've, you've achieved today? Do you still feel that way? How do you push past that? Okay, that is the beginning of every single assignment. Um, every single assignment is a controlled disaster where I start feeling completely out of my element. Um, part of that is because, um, you know, I, I follow my interests and so far my interests have always led me in completely different directions. Um, you know, I went, I went straight from the Vatican within a week into the jungle in Honduras and, and I had never, you know, had any exposure to, to either of them. Uh, the bounty hunters, no exposure to bounty hunters. Um, uh, radio telescope array in Chile. I was completely unqualified. I, I, I go into these completely unqualified for for any of them on paper. Um, so if you if you don't go into an assignment feeling like that, um, then I then I then I would say that you that perhaps there might be a little bit of arrogance or 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 um, or perhaps uh, in curiosity, uh, which is probably even a, a bigger sin. Um, so the the answer to that is all the time, and and that's normal, and you're supposed to feel that way. And and if you you're not really pushing yourself if you if you go into it thinking that you know you know exactly how to do something, how you're going to do it, and 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 that you're the right person for the job, and et cetera, et cetera. You know, I'm not saying don't be confident. I mean, be confident in, in yourself that you're going to, that you're going to make it work, but don't expect to walk in and have all the answers. Um, you know, often, uh, you know, uh, the, the Pope, the Pope, the Vatican story after, you know, basically five or six months, um, I was facing a disaster. I was facing a failure failed story right up until uh the last week of shooting um it was that it was that dire so so you you gotta um you, you uh you gotta it, it it's that it's normal it's normal and, and in fact you should feel that way so um let's see and uh so um i think that's that's what we've got time for today um and feel free to reach out to me on instagram i'm pretty easy to find on the internet um and uh if the uh if you have any questions uh and and, and i'm not up to my ears and something or other I'd, I'd be happy to be happy to answer anything in the future um I, Basically, just uh, uh, I think the most important thing is 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 never lose your curiosity and 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 if something sounds really interesting to you, think about taking it the next step and say, well, what can I do this? What can I do with this uh, that that hasn't been done before? And that's really uh, what I've been doing. That's the heart of what I've been doing this whole time. So. Um, so thanks everybody who who came to uh look at the pictures um i i i uh i hope it was uh helpful and uh look forward to doing this again sometime thank you very much